shortly though, Mimi uh, telling Nikolai of my knowledge of electronics, which I'd picked up in the Navy, allowed me to get a job with him, which was much more interesting. And there I worked in his sound room where he was beginning to do the early work with electronic music, one of the first people in this country. Nikolai would record live sounds and then modify them with tape recorders by running them at different speeds or backwards or cutting them up into little pieces and editing them together. And he wanted to branch out into electronically generated sounds, which is what I helped him do. Uh, I built several devices which would produce electronic sounds. Uh, the work with Nikolai, though, was uh, the, the, the stepping stone toward a, a better job, which came along at the Electronic Music Center of Columbia in Princeton. This was a Rockefeller-funded research lab that was actually a serious composers were really trying to understand what, how to, how to synthesize electronic sounds directly. And this required, first of all, figuring out what they consisted of. So this was fascinating to me, and while I considered myself a serious amateur musician, I, I knew perfectly well I didn't have the technique or the ability to think of a serious career in, as a musician, but I thought maybe I could do the same thing with visual arts, with sculpture. And around 63, I began to, the first experiments, which led to my first show. In fact, the very first piece I ever made of, in this vein, in this genre, was called Tower. It was a lattice of wire and close to 950 little tiny neon lamps, which I found on Canal Street. And these were wired together in this lattice so that each light could be uniquely be lit by choosing the particular wires that led to it. And by having a scanning mechanism in the base that shifted a contact from one uh, branch to another, you could create the illusion of the lights moving through the structure. And I thought of it as like, almost like you'd imagine fireflies moving in, inside a, a big bottle. So this piece worked wonderfully. I mean, I never expected it to work so well, and it really gave me the impetus to keep going. And following up that piece with one called City, used a similar kind of programming mechanism in the base, but instead of switching electrical contacts, it moved a light, a focused light around underneath a bundle of plastic rods, which functioned like today you would think of fiber optics. But in, uh, that had hardly come about when I was doing this. I was using just simple lucite rods, clear plastic rods, which could pipe the light just as effectively. And so these rods went up through a structure and out through the panels that you see in the picture here, and lighting up at ends and different colors coming and going as the color filter was moved around underneath them. So this it gave somewhat the vague impression of a city at night with lights coming on and off. and. Another piece was uh, later was called Dome, which uh, I was beginning to learn more and more about transistor circuits. And this piece was simple enough. It had a, two rings of lights underneath a transparent uh, hemispherical dome, and the lights lit up sequentially as the uh, transistor circuits, which are also built in visually circular forms to carry the theme along would switch the lights from one stage to the next. So these three pieces, by the time I'd gotten this far, I was really thought, I really knew I was onto something. So I decided to, to pull out all the stops and make one piece that incorporated all of these ideas. And that's the one that's called Watcher. And it, it consisted of two basic elements, a, a a display element, which was a grid of lamps that was controlled by switches and programming devices. And the patterns of light were then observed by a moving uh, sort of scanning section, which looked like a big circuit all built in three-dimensional form, all the components showing. And this, this circuit was, in fact, a, a miniature electronic synthesizer, which used its photocells to scan the light patterns in the 
display section. And a viewer would clearly see that when the patterns change, the sounds change. And it, it, in addition, it had the ability to change its, its uh, sound quality according to what environmental conditions were. If you walked up to it and shattered it, or if someone turned the lights on in the room, or the sun came out from behind a cloud, there would be a corresponding reaction and immediately you would see. So thus the no notion watcher, the piece was always watching for something or other, including itself. So when I had finished these four pieces, I was really thought that maybe I had a chance to show some work. And I, I'd already been in a little kind of amateur show up in Provincetown showing some stone pieces. And uh, this, it's, I, I, I like the notion of showing, and I decided to, to, to see what I could arrange, so I did what seemed logical to me, but now I realize it was pretty uh, audacious, but I went up to the Museum of Modern Art and asked the receptionist if I could see one of the curators, <laughs> and sure enough, she went upstairs, or called upstairs, and, and this young woman came down and looked at my book of pictures and uh, went back and came back again, and she gave me a list of ten galleries that she thought were the most likely to be interested in what I was doing. So I went immediately to the first one on the list, which was a gallery I already knew and thought might be a possibility. It was the Howard Wise Gallery. He had begun to show work involving scientific principles or phenomena like light and motion. So I took my book up there and they, now in those days galleries wouldn't look at your book of pictures with you sitting there. They, would make you come back, and so I had to. I was told to come back in a week. But when I came back, he hadn't had the chance, or for whatever reason, hadn't looked at my book. So I didn't want to leave it another week, and uh, I went on to the next on the list. And that gallery was actually interested, and was prepared to come down to my studio the coming Saturday, which was four days away. But I thought since I was in the neighborhood, I might as well keep going on the list and went to the third gallery, which was the stable gallery, and unaware of the fact that the stable gallery had a fantastic reputation, was the gallery that first showed a lot of the pop artists, which was Noguchi's gallery for a while, and many, many well-known artists had shown there. But I let, was, again, was required to leave my book, but this time only to go out and get a hamburger. When I came back, they were just unctuously welcoming and uh, sat me down and questioned me closely about the work and agreed to come down the next day, which I was staggered by. And when when she came down, this was Eleanor Ward, the owner of the gallery, she liked what she saw and said she would give me a show if I had enough work to fill the gallery. And I told her I could probably do that by the end of the summer this being about March, I think. So my show was scheduled for the 1st of November in 66. Uh, uh, and so it was, a, it was a great success. The show sold all but one piece. Uh, it, the work wound up in important collections, including museums, and it really started my career off with a bang. It enabled me to buy real, my own lathe, for example, which I had not had up to then anything, any decent tools. Uh, the other pieces in the show, which I finished over the summer there, before the summer of 66, were, if I recall, there was one called Tetra. There was one called um, Scanner and searcher, scanner and searcher and captive, those three all operated on the same general premise that they produced light as they moved around and they also reacted to light so that they were, they were reactive, inter, they were capable of interacting with people or with the environment. And having them all in the same gallery was astounding to me because they were reacting and interacting with each other and I think that completely colored my whole thinking from then on and showed me the direction I, I should continue to go in. There were some other pieces that were, were, were essentially passive. There was a piece called Eight, and there was, uh, let me think, a 
believe that's all. There were actually nine pieces, despite the fact that the show was billed as eight electronic sculptures. Out of that show came a number of opportunities to do things like give talks, teaching. I had an offer to teach at first at the School of Visual Arts and then at Rutgers and then eventually at Princeton. I had several important commissions, including one by the Performing Arts Foundation of Kansas City, which was for a piece which came to be called Electronic Peristyle. That was in a show called Magic Theater, and it was the idea of the curator who proposed it to do something. To, he was inspired by the uh, Herman Hesse novel, Steppenwolf. The idea was to produce these these environments, and in those days an environment was a kind of newly minted term for a sculpture or an installation that was so big that you went into it. It was not something you related to one to one like a conventional sculpture, but it was an, in, it was an enclosed or semi-enclosed area in which all your sensations would be uh, uh, addressed, and or it would essentially react to what you did. There were a number of well-known artists, uh, Stephen Antonakis and Terry Riley and Boyd Mefford, and um, I think there were eight of us in all.